Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Linda Reed Anover, and welcome back to another Business, Business, Business Skills webinar. That is a mouthful to get out every time I do this. Who named this business? Um, for, we are being joined today by a long-term BBB member, friend of both Clive and myself, Stephen Brown, who is here to talk to us about contracts and working with contracts within your business. Now, as business owners, we touch base with contracts more often than not. And Stephen, I don't know if you saw the post in the group the other day about the bikini business, that uh, refunds policy that, you know, their contract that slightly got them fined by the ACCC. Um, yes, he's nodding his head. <laughs> I've had a number of clients have had troubles with the ACCC on their refund policy. Yep. So, you know, we have contracts every day within our business and what you may not, what you may not think is a contract is a contract. Now we are, uh, Stephen is here to answer your questions, but first of all, what is a contract, Stephen? Um, well, th th Linda, there's two answers to, to the question. I'll take both. <laughs> uh, the legal answer is that a contract is an arrangement between two or more parties where there is an offer, acceptance, consideration, intention to be l legally bound. So when you, and, and then the parties have the legal capacity to enter into the agreement. And so that's the, the legal answer. So you need to work out, has there been an offer? Has that offer been accepted? Is there consideration? Uh, for example, if you say to, um, uh, to a child, uh, go out and wash my car, then you're not offering them anything for that task. So it's not contractual. If you were to say it to a group of scouts that was doing um, the Bob a Job week, uh, then clearly there may well be a contractual nature because of the intent or the relationship of the party. So uh, the, the same words can be contractual, though they can't, depending on the circumstances. The next aspect is the practical aspect of what a contract, and that's the one that most business people really need to be focused on. Yep. Uh, I don't think business people need to be focused on the minutiae of, of the legal nature of an offer and acceptance. And the practical answer is that a contract is a checklist or rule book of who is to do what, when is it to be done, and how is it to be done? And if, if you can answer those three questions from both sides of the contracting parties, you've, you've basically answered and got your contract. Yep. And the, the real challenge is that very few clients ever can answer those questions when put to them. For, for example, a client will come and say, look, um, I want a cleaning contract, okay? I can put one together. I can put one using lots of weasel words, a reasonable <laughs> period of time. Uh, it needs to be done professionally. And, and it's those sort of things that you see all the time. But a contract really should be tailor-made to be the actual checklist, like you're going on holidays. Have I got my toothpaste? Have <laughs> I got my toothbrush? Um, if, I, if you're going skiing, have I got my ski boots? Have I got my gogs and gloves? gloves as opposed to no point in taking the costumes uh, or your diving gear if you're doing a ski trip exactly so so getting that that correct if you've then got it correct you can then use it as a management tool and i think that's where people have forgotten that contracts were designed to be checklists so that people knew what they had to do when they had to do it the Contracts go back to the 12th and 13th centuries. And kings would have contracts and they would say to their barons, I will give you this parcel of land, this estate, and in order for you to maintain your rights to have this estate, you'll need to give me so many bushels of wheat every year, so many bales of wool, and when I'm going off to fight, you need to give me 15 knights with 50 arrowmen, uh, 50 archers and 50 people on staffs or, or something like this. Yep. So there was this whole hierarchy of the king having the barons, the barons having their liege men underneath them and everyone having actual contracts of supplying um, men and services for 
the, the work. So it was literally the checklist. Wow. And um, what's happened is that with the Industrial Revolution, people want things quick and quick, uh, quick and smart. Yep. And so we get these weasel words or generic contracts. I'm which, liking weasel words. I'm, that's a new... <laughs> yeah, they, because they, they, they work. You sort of look at them and they look commercially sound. Yep. The problem is that you've got two parties to a contract. Party A reads those weasel words as they understand or want the deal to proceed. Party B reads them often in a very different light. Right, yeah, as they see it, yep. Yeah. And, and that's when you then have the conflict and problems mm -hmm. because they the parties never have sat down to actually work out what needs to be done. Um, for instance, with the cleaning contract example, let's say that the person who wants the cleaning actually wants a cleaner to be available at a shopping center whilst so wherever the shopping center is open yep. to clean the toilets and mop up any spills. If that crucial fact is not given to the cleaning contractor, they may simply quote on having someone coming in between six and nine yep. to do a day's cleaning. Exactly. Um, and, and people just don't get it right. They, they don't look at the minutia, sure. yep. uh, which is what I find. Wow. Okay. So guys, if you're watching the live stream today, there is a link in both the watch party and the live stream up the top for you to come in and join Stephen and I so that you can come and ask Stephen your questions directly. If you've had thing, been thinking about a question about contracts, um, question about you know, what a contract means to your business, this is your time to come in, tap into his brain, tap into his knowledge and uh, put your checkbook away because Stephen's answering them for you today. <laughs> yeah, you might need a checkbook later if it's, you know, some highly detailed stuff. But right now, he's here giving his time to ask questions. So, Stephen, I, your cleaning one's a really cool one because I actually worked for a company where we had a cleaning contract and it wasn't well negotiated and it didn't include emptying the rubbish bins. Yeah. Um, and the cleaner basically refused. And I was like, well, actually, there's nothing we can do. It doesn't include it. It's not on the list of things that needs to be done. Um, you know, and, but, you know, we were a rather paper-based office at that particular point in time and carrying down the shredding down three flights of stairs was not a fun job. <laughs> no, no, it, it, and it's like that all the time. That you, yep. you get cleaners in, you know, does it include cleaning the windows? Yep. Does it include exactly. uh, dusting the shelves? Um do you want them to touch your desk or not touch the desk? desk. Oh, yes, that's a good one because I never want them to touch my desk. No. <laughs> Tara no. has a question for us. So I'm going to unmute Tara and allow her to talk. Hi, Tara. Oh, hang on. I'll unmute now. I'll probably do it. Come on. Buttons work. Tara, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Hello. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Advance warnings. Stephen, Tara and I working on her PR and branding at the moment. So, <laughs> so say hi. Hi. How are you going, Stephen? Very well, thanks, Tara. How can I help? Well, my question is, is about how far you go. So my business, I write grants, tenders and business cases for people. And I suppose um, with grant applications, there's often a very short time frame. So they come to me and their grants due in a week or two weeks. So the time that it takes to, like I have a, I have a, a contract template that somebody drew up for me, but the time that it takes to write up that, you know, the, the actual schedule to that contract, get them to sign it, um, it it's quite, yeah, you sort of go, sometimes it puts them off. They go, oh, what's this is a bit much. All I wanted was for you to just write my grant. Um, so it can put them off. And also it does take a, quite a bit of time when I'm desperately trying to get their grant deadline met often. I was wondering, is it possible instead of having a contract for every little piece of work to have like a terms of engagement or something, something which says that, like, is it valid? If I send them a terms of engagement that says, Thanks for engaging me. Here you go. If you're not happy with that, let me know. But not actually saying you have to sign anything, which can scare them. Yeah. Um, what you're actually... Let me go back. The nomenclature, um, which is the fancy word for title, 
uh, to something, whether it's a letter of engagement or a contract, it's still a contract. Okay. So, so the courts don't look at it that way. And can you have a contract without it being signed? Well, you do, and you do it every day. Uh, if you go into Coles and buy some milk and you walk down the bottom of the store, grab the milk, go out to the check, self-checkout cash register, put it through the scanner, get your iPhone, pay the money and walk out, you've actually formed and concluded a contract without any words or without any writing. And so what you're really doing in the scenario that you've posited is that, yes, you have a letter of engagement which said, I will do these things, these are what I'm going to do, this is what you're going to pay me, and uh, if you email me back to say to proceed, that's fine. And that will be as valid as if you had a document that you'd sign, sent out to them, they sign it and send it back. Absolutely. Great. Perfect. Thank you very much. And, and in fact, you know, depending on how um, secretive you wish to be, you can even have it on your website and say, um, I'm prepared to do the work based upon the terms of my engagement that are on my website. Please review them and let me know that you want to proceed. Yes, okay, cool. And that'll even save you sending out the letter. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well done. Thanks, Tara, for asking a question. Feel free to ask more if you've got them. Okay, we've got a couple from people who don't have microphones. Uh, do, 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 do. Here we go. Small font, Stephen, glasses, and I'm too tired and need more coffee. Um, when entering a contract, the first one, this is actually quite a good one. When entering a contract, how important is it to identify times? It's crude. Well, it depends upon what type of contract you're looking at. Yeah. Um, if time is important to you, for example, if you were, well, we're going back to the cleaning contract, keep yeah. it consistent. If you want someone to be available whilst so whether the shopping center is open, then time's crucial. You need to specify they need to be there all the time. And then you need to make accommodation for are you allowing them to have a lunch break or do does the cleaning company need to have someone to replace them during that lunch break period? So going through this detail is, is crucial. If you're looking at uh, purchasing raw materials, mm -hmm. if it is time crucial that raw materials get delivered by a particular period, then specifying that it must be delivered within that period is important. Yep. Uh, Coles and Woolworths, for example, in their contracts, they specify that when they have an order, it has to be delivered within a 20 minute window. Okay. And if they don't, if you don't make your sh lotted, allotted time, huh. Coles and Woolworths have the right to say, we're not taking your um, delivery Good anymore. Order. Come back. Uh, and if it happens more than twice, they can terminate your entire contract. Right. Uh, so it, it, you've got to, um, I don't know who asked the question, but who, whoever's who asked the question, it depends upon how important it is. Yep. In New South Wales, if you're buying land, you have a six-week settlement period as, as a general rule. Mm -hmm. The time period at the conclusion of the six weeks is not set in stone unlike in Queensland. In okay, Queensland, yep. it's time of the essence, which means that if you don't settle on that day, the seller can end the contract, take your 10% and move on. In New South Wales, if you don't settle on that day, well, it's all right. They then have to issue a notice and you have to do other things. So you can make New South Wales contracts time of the essence. Yep. So it depends upon the nature of the contract and how important time is to the particular transaction. Okay, cool. Yes. Uh, I use time. <laughs> but I, I use time and most probably this most probably comes from my point of view is we have a, a, a limit when I'm working with people on the number of hours included on, mm. on, a, on a delivery because um, 
quite often we can get into a project and and the neediness as a as a consultant of the client changes how much time I've got to spend responding responding to emails, taking phone calls, all of those sorts of things. Um, and what went from a yes, if I had a straight run on it, it was a four hour job turns into a ten hour job. Yeah. Yep. Um, so we have a maximum number of hours, you know, the contract, you know, the services for, for this particular amount of hours. Um, and that's, I can, I can see time being, well, it's always been important in my list of those sorts of things because I only have so much of it to give. Absolutely. Um, and like with lawyers, we, 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 we charge by time, but yep. we generally don't, um, specify how long, because we just don't know a lot of the yeah, time. No. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, one other question that we have from the same person. Um, actually, this is a really good one, especially for a lot of BBB members, and this is something that will pop up for heaps of people. Um, single person business owner, so freelancer, ready to, to grow their business, um, or you know, um, possibly even a small business owner just on their own, um, has enough uh, wants to engage a worker but doesn't have enough work to, to satisfy an employee, should the new person be on a contract and it doesn't make a difference if the person trades as a business? Um, uh, this is a big one. Yeah, <laughs> which person trades as a business? The person... So the, I believe the employee, yeah, what, the, what, would, what would be the... the employee. employee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, not, they're not employee, but yes. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, the short answer is... If you need additional assistance, then getting contractors in yep. is the way to proceed. Yep. Um, the contractor, it's safer if they give you an ABN, but obviously yes. you don't have to have an ABN from the person um, that that person's not making 75000 a year. But if okay. you don't, if they don't have an ABN, then you don't want to be in the middle of them later on saying, well, they were in fact an employee. So yes. if you're going to have a contractor, it is crucial that you do have a contract ERS agreement with them. Yep. Yep. Specifies yep. that the relationship between you and that person is that you're not employer or employee yep. or partner in a partnership or joint venturers. But yes. Are a contractor principal with a subcontractor. And that the subcontractor will cover their own workers' compensation insurance, that they will give you invoices upon which GST is to be charged, that they will invoice you at, a, at an appropriate time. Yep. Now, you need to be very careful that if you start imposing a, a lot of control over how that contractor is to work, then the control test may transmognify them from being a contractor if they are if a court truly saw them as an employee to becoming an employee yep so it no, no matter what you say in the contract if it's a cat then it'll be a cat um, but just because it's got four <laughs> legs and a tail doesn't make it a dog oh, yep. so, um, <laughs> if you're trying to be a bit too cute then a court can just look through it and say well would you think you're being too cute and they, this person really is an employee, employee. So you yeah. need to make sure that they, they're doing it properly. Mm. So I suppose, Stephen, the, the safe answer in that area is when we're looking at it, it's more sporadic work or more, more well, what, you know, uh, but even hiring services like your own. I don't need a lawyer every day of the week. Mm. Would I like to have one on my team? Yes, but not at your hourly rate. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can, I can go on holidays for that. <laughs> But, you know, it's about, you know, hiring that help when you need it. And the same thing when people come and hire me. They don't want me as an employee because, A, I suck as being an employee. Um, and, B, the last last thing I want to do is be told when I can work and what I can do and, and how I can do it. Just give me the job and I'll fit it yep. in around what I'm doing. Um, as you and I discussed, I had started at 5 this morning. I'm pretty sure no one wants me to turn up at their workplace at 5 a.m. in the morning. Um so there we go, guys. If anyone else has got any more questions, we've had those couple of questions. Stephen, from a contract's point of view, and obviously we, we hear about that, that subcontractor arrangement coming up quite a bit in BBB, you know, I've got, I've got some work and I want to do that. But also from the, from the subbies point of view, from the person who's actually giving out their, their services and time and doesn't want to be an employee but quite happy to take that direction, where do they stand in all of that? 
Um, absolutely fine. Again, as long as it's protected, that everyone understands what the relationship is. Yep. Then um, it, it's it's quite uh, appropriate. Yeah. Uh, what the they they do need to make sure that they've got well. If they're working through a company, they'll need to make sure they have workers' comp. Yep. If the subcontractor is an individual, then they won't need to have their own workers' compensation. Mm -hmm. um, so an individual, a sole trader, doesn't need workers' comp for themselves. Okay. Uh, but from the principal's point of view, uh, making sure that they've got workers' comp is certainly worthwhile. Yes. Because some of the state's legislations will deem a contractor to be a worker in some circumstances. Yep. So if you don't have it, you can end up in a problem of having to deal with a workers' compensation issue when you don't have insurance, and then you can be penalised for not having the insurance. So um, one of the uh, sessions we did with Clive was about ignorance of the law. Yes. And this sort of brings up this ignorance of the law issue. I'll grab that, I'll grab that uh, link while you're talking. <coughs> It's, it's really important, everyone, that ask, asking a lawyer questions before there is a problem is far cheaper and easier and beneficial for you than thinking that you can do something and finding out later on there's a problem. Because a lot of legislation this day is strict liability. Yep. The consequence of strict liability is that intention is irrelevant. It's like a speeding case. If you're found to be above the speed limit at a road, the police are going to fine you. And your reason for it becomes irrelevant. They don't care. They're just going to fine you. And a lot of business laws are now like that. And you'll get, potentially be fined and just have to do with the fine. There's nothing you can then uh, justify it. Fine. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, one other question we've got here. Does a legal person have to write the agreement? Mm, ah. A legal person doesn't have to write the agreement, but it is technically illegal for a non-lawyer to write an agreement and charge you for it. Okay, which makes sense. Yeah, uh, so, so if you write your own agreement, that's fine. If someone wrote your agreement and they did not charge you, and it was a genuine, say, where well, you can use this document, yep. and absolutely you don't need a lawyer. Um, if someone wrote an agreement, so now, now I'm playing devil's advocate because, you know, that's the troubleshooter in me. So if someone wrote an agreement, say a business coach or whatever, wrote an agreement for someone, do they, are they liable if the agreement does not stand up? Yep. They don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> seriously not worth it. <laughs> it it is far better to pay the lawyers and that way you've got the insurance of the professional indemnity insurance that's yep. that's why the some of the fees are expensive the, oh, it, because you know we have huge insurance liabilities which are mandated on us when to get, we take out our practice certificate each year yep no completely agree <laughs> i think now our firms insurance or something our premium i think is about a hundred thousand a year yeah so, wow you know, besides rent and everything before we can even make a dollar we have to find a hundred thousand dollars to pay for the for the work indemnity insurance insurance kylie says thank you to that one so there we go guys but just a just slight tip don't write agreements for anyone else you know hire Stephen or someone else to do to do those for you because that would be a much better idea yeah I, I like to keep my business, not give it to someone else. And even some of the stuff that's online, um, you'll, you'll note in the disclaimer, sort of saying, um, here's a document, but we're not giving you legal advice. Yeah. <laughs> um, query how, how far that, that would go, that disclaimer. Okay. It, it's certainly telling the world at large that you're not getting specific legal advice because right, you, yeah. you can't. It, it's yeah. just a generic document. Beautiful. So if anyone else has any questions, you can ask them here in the webinar. You can ask them on the live, on the watch party, and I will try and interpret text talk now. Live, live uh, sorry, watch party people, we are a little bit behind in time. So just give me a second to catch up. Um, otherwise, you can come into the webinar and ask Stephen your questions and have them answered quite well. Um, Stephen, what's it? 
what's one of the weirdest contract questions you've ever been asked? Yeah, see, I'm different to Clive. I come up with random questions. <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> um, I know. I know. Someone has. There's a lot of people who are putting provisions in for their will for their pets. Um, so that that's pretty much out there. But uh, yeah. a lot of people are doing that now. Um, so that that's a bit weird. Um, it, it it's. <sighs> No, I can't really. I'll catch think, it. <laughs> I can't think of anything that's really weird that's, that's out there. Um, you know, we've done cleaning contracts, uh, contracts for sales of business, um, contracts for um, cars, marketing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, there's, there's, there's basically anything, but no, there's not, nothing totally. Oh, I said, look, we acted for a brothel owner once. Yep. Um, and the brothel owner was, was wanting to know what his contractual obligations were for their staff uh, as to if the particular pr person providing the services um, was saying, look, this is the best sex you're going to get. Um, uh, where, where would that put them? And um, so, but it, it wasn't a written contract. So, um, and I, I don't know what was said in the privacy of the cubicles. So <laughs> it's hard to say. Yeah, very, very hard to say. So that, that, was, that was sort of fairly much out there. But um, I look at it from a 10-year-old's point of view. Charlotte walks around and she watches the signs come up in town that says best pizza in Bendigo. What happens if they're not the best? How do they know they're the best? Yeah. And, 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 and that, I would like to know too, what happens if they're not the best pizza, Stephen? That's my problem. I don't want to go and find out they're not. <laughs> Section 18, Australian Consumer Law, Misleading and Deceptive Conduct. Yep. And you have to do a, a, a test on, is the statement puffery or is it meant to be taken serious? Yep. Now, the best way to describe that, was there was a Procter & Gamble ad um, that made, uh, Procter & Gamble makes, uh, amongst a lot of things, Pantene. Yep. And this particular ad had two gentlemen in white coats in a laboratory behind them and they were saying look the, the these scientists say these wonderful things about Pantene that it's the best it just so happened that the particular people were Procter and Gamble scientists <laughs> and that wasn't disclosed in the advertisement, advertisement yep. so the ACCC took Procter and Gamble to task by saying that that was misleading and deceptive because the target audience would take it that scientists meant an independent person, yep. not a person employed by Procter & Gamble. Therefore, although the statement was true, because these people, in fact, had given testimonials that it was correct so far as they were concerned, it was nevertheless misleading to the target audience because it was not puffery. It was not a yep. self evident exaggeration so um that that's the dividing line it, it it's easy to sort of illustrate it's very hard to give a general principle and, and make a determination no that does her head in every time she sees someone say that like with the kid what do you how do you know <laughs> well, you can always test it you can always go to court and give it a go I just go and ask them what evidence they've done on their on their best pizza <laughs> examination. Mm. Um, okay, so in business, uh, sorry, as business owners now, we should all have a privacy policy. That's going to be one of our contracts that we should have, especially if we're using websites. What the, should we have? What should we well, have in place with the, our the, contracts? The technical answer. Look, a lot. I do recommend it as a as a general provision. Yep. Um, just because a lot of people do, it looks more professional and it's worthwhile. Yep. Strictly speaking, unless your turnover is over three million dollars, you are not mandated to have a privacy policy. Okay. So privacy policies technically only kick in once your revenue reaches three million dollars and above per annum. Ah. So, the, and, and there are some loopholes in, in that as well, because um, if, if you're under $3 million, then you can do whatever you like with your privacy policy <laughs> because you're not caught by the legislation technically. 
<laughs> that is an interesting fact because I have seen statements out there saying all websites must have a privacy policy. All, yeah. yep. No. But, ah. but, but as, a, as a general rule of thumb, it, it, it yep. makes your business look better if you do. Yep. Yep. So, yep. And um, it's nice to have. Most websites should have a privacy policy as a yep. general rule. They should also have a terms and use policy. Yep. That is, if someone posts something on your site, you want the contractual right to take it off. Yep. Um, you also want a contractual right that people can't take your logos and use it. Yes. You also want the right that if you've posted material that they can't use it without, um, if, if you don't want them to, without giving you moral rights attribution yep. or a blanket prohibition. Yep. If your website is a sales platform, then in addition, you need terms and conditions of sale. So, yep. So they're the three forms of uh, documents that you would have yeah, like names, yeah. and we have pro formers if anyone wants them oh, yes. <laughs> and, and will I, where will i find that link um oh, that's okay we'll get it in the replay yeah doing the email just send me an email oh, i will get, get it in the replay yeah, okay yeah. Beautiful. Or you can send Stephen an email. So there you go, guys. You can send Stephen an email to get those proformers. And if you do nothing else from today's webinar, check that out. Check the proformers out for that sort of stuff, for your privacy, for your terms and conditions, for your terms of sale. There's lots of members that I know running e-commerce stores, you know, that you know, things like you don't want to get caught with a refund policy, with a blanket no refund policy and get fined massive amounts for it, as has happened in the media this week. And that's the one we know of, guys. It's how many others have occurred this week that we don't know of. So make sure that you've got those sorts of things covered. So, Stephen, obviously we've got our, we've got our um, privacy policy, we've got our terms of service. If we're a service provider providing services, um, as Tara was mentioning, terms of engagement or terms of um, contracts. Yep. Contracts, yep. So you've got your contracts there as well. What if you're a retail store and someone walks into your store? What's your contract with that with that person walking through the door in the retail store? The contract is um, essentially implied by the Australian Consumer Law and the Sale of Goods Act in each of the states. Yep. The Australian Consumer Law imposes mandatory statutory guarantees that the goods that are being purchased are um, fit for purpose, that the seller of the goods owns those goods and they're not encumbered by any security, um, that the goods are new unless otherwise explained not to be new. Um, so th there are these statutory warranties and they can't be excluded. Um, Section 64 of the Act prevents them from being excluded, so you can't contract. And so that's how the person with the, the bikini got into an issue. Yep. Because it is an offence under Section 29M, I think, oh, there you of go. the Act to state that your estate to state in your terms and conditions something that is not true. Okay. And not true that you're not entitled to a refund. Because if goods are seriously defective, you have a statutory right to have a refund under the Act. Because you can't, can't contract out of that, to state that you aren't getting a guarantee or not going to be given one in your contract is therefore an offence. So it becomes a bit circular, but that's what happens. That's how, this is. That's how it happened. But it's handy to know. It's handy to know all of those sorts of things. Okay, and guys. Where, sorry, that's where people get caught by just picking up pro forma standard terms and conditions from, say, an American site. Yep. Or picking them off someone else's website. Don't yeah. do that. <laughs> no. Don't do that. There's so many rules and wrong there. Yeah. Nothing wrong, though, to double check. <laughs> no, 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 seriously, I think yeah. it is wise if you've got a competitor and they've got their website to see what they've got there. Um, yeah. That's just, uh, you know, market intelligence to double check that what they've got, um, you're, you've covered off on. Yep. Uh, to make sure it's, it's fine. Um, we did a contract the other day where our client was looking to borrow $2 million on equipment to purchase a business down in Melbourne. Yep. And they were wanting security just over the forklifts that were being purchased. 
the particular contract has clauses in it that says if at any time the lender chooses, they can request the borrower and the guarantor to provide security over any and all real estate which the parties own. Oh. Now, the borrower wasn't happy with those provisions, but they were tucked away and yep. they're quite enforceable. Yep. And so the borrowers had to go off to another lender whose terms and conditions don't have those provisions in it. Yep. So knowing what's in the contract is important. Question that I think would come up for a few of our members, and this is just me thinking off the top of my head. If anyone else has got any other questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, Stephen, I'll most probably wrap up after this one. Um, question that I have coming up is we quote, lots of business owners quote, lots of service providers quote, and then they get the verbal go ahead or the email go ahead to commence work. Yep. And they invoice, but they don't have anything signed. That's fine. Um, what the situation that you've just discussed is a, an important one because it raises what is known as the battle of the forms. Yep. Now, in the quote that's sent out, are there terms and conditions attached to the quote or incorporated by reference into the quote? On mine, there are, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I don't know if everyone else's are there. Uh, is, so. So, so what we have is a situation where party A, you, send out a quote based upon your terms and conditions. Yep. What can sometimes happen is that the recipient of that sends back to you an acknowledgement saying, yes, we want you to proceed, but on our terms and conditions. Yes. So whose terms and conditions in that instance prevail? And you need to be mindful to double check that that's not happening, that the client's yeah. terms and conditions yours by you proceeding in that situation, by you going ahead and then um, arguing later on or having to spend over $100,000 arguing who was in fact right. Yep. Um, so get the signature in other words. Well, not even, not even the, in that case, even with the signature, you still got to work out who came first. first and, yep. if, and if someone has sent back a response with terms and conditions attached, yep. you need to go back and say, we are proceeding based upon our initial quote, yep. not your acceptance and, and have it clarified. Yep. Beautiful. No, that's, that's a big one because I know there's lots of, lots of service providers out there that get hit by that and lots of business owners that also don't read the terms and conditions that come with their quotes. Do so. Absolutely. Um, you know, guys, it's, it's really important. It's about your business and protecting your business in, in amongst that process. And if someone wants to change your terms and conditions, normally my response would be uh, have a good chat to your team and your legal team. Make sure that you're feeling comfortable with the change. But normally... Stephen, I don't know what your thought is, but you've put those terms and conditions in a place for a reason. Yeah. And look, but having said that, um, talking to people and being flexible, yep. in some cases, you, you can get rid of it. It might be worthwhile. Um, but especially now, there's um, the fair contract, the unfair contract provisions yep. within sections 26 to 28 of the Australian Consumer Law. And that essentially states that where you have a standard form contract with a small business, and that's business to business or, or business to consumer, and the term is later at any time after the contract's ended into, held by a court to be unfair, is unfair. The court yep. has the power to take out the clause, rewrite the clause, rewrite the contract. And it can be four years after the contract was even entered into. Yep. And clauses that have been held to be unfair are where a fitness club has the right to unilaterally change the terms of the contract, where there are continuation clauses. Yep. The contract continues from year to year and it has to be a 12-month notice. 
um, where the courts have said, well, that's a bit unfair. If someone misses out giving you a notice, um, it shouldn't go for 12 months. They should have a, a right to terminate the contract on a reasonable period of time. Um, so having those types of, my point is that if someone asks you to change a standard form contract, yep. sometimes doing it is good because you can then say the person had a right to negotiate. Yep. We negotiate that negates the contract being a standard form contract, which then prevents them from making any application That's under true. their contract regime. There we go. See, and this is why you hire the lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> this is definitely why you hire the lawyer. I'm just going to go and check in some other places. Um, see, uh, when do customers, there, there we go. Greg's asked this one. Um, when do customers have terms and conditions? I thought it was always the suppliers. No, no, no. They're often um, customers, well, for example, Coles is a customer yep. of um you know, Gillette, whoever. Coles issue purchase orders. Yes. And the purchase orders, the, the, the supply by Gillette to Coles is based upon Coles' purchase order, which contains the terms and conditions, not those of Procter & Gamble. So it, um, it, it, any party can prepare the contract. It doesn't have to be the supplier. Yep. Normally it is the supplier is dealing with a lot of customers that don't have it but where you are a supplier or a customer that has a great deal of market share and power then yes you've got the ability to say i will only buy on my terms yep and, and those terms allow coles and woolworths to um say we will normally buy at your list price but if we want to run a sale and discount your products, we're gonna run that sale and you'll take the lesser amount that we determine is appropriate for this case. And, and that's what they do. And that's what they, yeah. Uh, and, and you can't get away with the unfair contracts provision in that type of contract because the uh, amount of money uh, removes the contract from being a small business transaction. Yeah. It only applies to a small business transaction, which is a company that has 20 or fewer employees and where the contract is a 300,000 in the first 12 months or a million over three years. So it doesn't apply to, to Gillette apply, yep. places. Yep. Pretty much. Okay. Wow. Okay, guys. What an information. I think I've learned a bit. I've learned, a, I've learned something about privacy policies that I didn't yeah. know today. So that is great. And uh, it's all interesting. But, um, you know, this is the thing when you get to come and do Q&A sessions like this. So I can't see any further questions. So we might wrap up, Stephen. I'm just going to let everyone else know you're back with us again. So I'm just going to again bring the page up. In the chat boxes, guys, I have popped in the link to the skills, we uh, not skills webinar, the yeah. podcast, because for those of you who don't know, because... You know, it's Clive Singh and I don't normally talk about it here. <laughs> Clive has a podcast called Business Conversations with Clive Enema. Stephen came on and they did. It was the first episode we published. It was great. Uh, it had re heaps of really good information in it on ignorance of the law is no excuse. It was one podcast that I was quite happy to listen back to as I'm getting ready to load it and do all of those sorts of things. So please bear that in mind. Go and have a listen to it. Now, Tara, who you saw ask us a question earlier, is coming to talk to you about getting grants for your business on the 11th of June. Now, that one is already, we only put it live yesterday. It's filling up already. Make sure that you jump into that webinar very shortly. Um, then on the 18th of June, we have um, uh, Renee Hasseldine joining us to talk about supercharging your business with the signature sales system. Renee and I were in Adelaide together. Just come and watch this lady, the information you are going to get from it and knowing what your system and the stuff you're going to learn about a business journey along the way is huge. And then Stephen, 27th of August, you and I are talking yes. franchising. We are. But before that, we are doing something pretty special, aren't we? We are doing the Small Business Skills Summit. And the Small Business Skills Summit runs from August 1st to 11, 11 days, 11 presenters, 11 information sessions, plus don't know if you've been brought up to speed with this yard yet, some panel sessions. And I'm looking at putting Stephen, 
uh, Clive and Liz, our accounts person, all about business systems and procedures into a panel. So where you get to come into a session like this and ask them questions and really get that out there. The Skill Summit tickets will go on sale on the 15th of June. I will pop a link into the replay here and in the chat for everyone as well to go and register for the wait list for that one so that you've got a chance of being able to join us. The Skill Summit is amazing, guys. It is a massive share of information and it's a really good kickstart for your business to get through some amazing information. So Stephen's being joined by Doyle, who was here with us last week, by Karen Hillen coming to talk about um, HR for your staff. We've got, um, we've got, who else have we got coming in? We've got, um, We've got Melinda Sampson coming in to talk about Google Ads. Jess Richards is coming in to talk about Facebook Ads. Um, we've got J. Chris Crow, who I also saw in Adelaide, coming to talk to you about copy for your business now. It's worthwhile making sure that you come and just take her copy classes. We can all learn stuff from each other, and that is definitely one of the things that we can learn. And there's so much more happening. I will get the lineup fully out over the next couple of days. But the presenters and I had a bit of a chat yesterday. Um, oh, and I know. Well, Suzanne was Suzanne was in there with you. We we caught we caught caught you know it's me and couple, um, but we've got some great panel stuff coming up. We've got some great information within that skill summit. So if you haven't had a chance to register on the waitlist for that one, register on the waitlist because that is our focus for August. That um, until the so basically from the end of July through to August through to August there'll be the skill summit and then Stephen coming in and doing franchising at the end of it. Stephen, you're talking about what businesses need to know. Is that correct? Your topic? Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head now. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think that's what it is. Um, yeah, along something along those lines. But seriously, guys, it's worth it just to come on because I know what the content is. Uh, well, I know what your content is a little bit more about the business journey and the league. I think it's more business journey. I, I, I think it's the business. It's more. It's more about the business journey, and and, yeah. and it's a bit. I suppose it, it follows. I think a little bit from the ignorance of the law and, and looking at the issues yep. of, of what areas to look at fantastic um, and that is going to be huge we all need to know those areas yeah. so guys that's it for another week crazily enough we've just done a skill webinar Stephen, thank you for joining me Pleasure. for those of them who, you who want to work with Stephen, you can head to his website um which i will grab and pop into the chat and the replay for you again later um remember to grab those proformers from Stephen, if you don't know anything else. And if you do need legal advice, guys, to, you've just heard it now. Stephen talks to you in a way that takes away the legal stress, um, puts it in terms that you understand and um, has been a long-term BBB member and will help you as much as you possibly can over the next little while with your legals. So touch base with Stephen and chat base, chase with him. Otherwise, I will see you same time next week talking grants with Tara. So head to businessbusinessbusiness.com.au forward slash skills and that will get you registered. Is Tara still there? Tara, are you still there? Hang on, let me unmute her. Tara, are you still there? Can you hear us? Oh, sorry, I didn't, didn't catch that. <laughs> That's okay. Steve, Steve wanted to know if you were still here. <laughs> I am, yes. Yes, I am, of course. Linda, can I ask Tara a question on, on something about grants? Yeah, go for it. Um, Tara, do you know much about the export grants for and, and research and development grants? Yes, yep, I do. The um, EDM ones, the export development ones, they're um, a very specialised grant. Um, but I do know about them, but I would direct you to someone who deals only with those grants as the expert on those okay. with the um with the research and development they're just yeah they're just normal grants but yes i know about those ones because uh i'm not doing it but i was talking to someone last night and they were saying that they need to actually have paid the expenses before the, the grant money will be issued yeah, so that's where I say the export market development ones, they are <clears throat> unusual. They're not like other grants. So most grants, that's completely not the case. They won't pay retrospective. Um, but with the expert market development ones, it, it's a very unique um, grant. And they actually have um, people who are signed up as e EMD experts to, to help out because they are 
they're not so much of a grant as they are a, a yeah, they pay you back some money and you have to meet all these criteria and it, it's a bit, it's very different. Okay. Because um, they, they asked me how, I thought of a way how they could pay it without actually having the cash. Um, <laughs> uh, I, was just I reckon I should muscle. connect you two offline so you can have a <laughs> of our grants. <laughs> How about we do that? How about I introduce you and Tara via email and you can have a chat? Very good. Um, I was going to do that anyway, but, you know, you've just stepped ahead a couple of weeks in our process, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, thank you very much for joining us. Have a great week. And if that wasn't enough reason to come and see Tara, Tara, have you got a plug for you, everyone coming and talking to you next week? Well, you're yeah, on. come and ask as many questions as you want. I can tell you all about how to get grants for your business and where to find them and, and the kinds of questions you need to make sure you address in, in every grant application, uh, except for export markets because they are just a little bit different. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, come and join us next week, guys. We look forward to seeing you around soon. And uh, if you haven't joined the Skills Webinar, uh, the Skills summit waitlist yet make sure that you're on that one because it is going to be a jam packed online summit remember the skill summits online it comes to you where you are and you get to take it when you're available to catch up with that stuff have a great week everyone bye. i will see you around for those attending what's on for kids i'll see you on the gold coast on friday bye bye, bye. thank you